All right, guys, we're going to start uh, today's lecture on the impact of social media on a pharmacy manager. This is the first part. We're going to break this up into two sections to kind of uh, uh, keep you from having to sit in front of the computer for 30 minutes to get through the lecture. So for part one, we want to cover some basic uh, social media history, identify a web 2.0 or a social media application, and explain the e-professional and explain e-professionalism. Before we get started, I uh, want to you know just talk a little bit about my uh, my own experiences and and uh, give you a little background with on me as it relates to social media uh, and and kind of share how my experience uh, has has impacted me and uh, and how I face some of the pros and cons of using social media. In 2004, I joined Facebook at the age of 20. Uh, again, just with other friends at the University of Kentucky, Facebook was kind of in its infancy. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, put it, well, again, or the Winklevoss twins, whoever whoever invented Facebook at Harvard, put it together in, in 2004. And by the end of 2004, it seemed like every college university had, had the application. In 2008, I actually ran for a national office with APHA uh, as well as started a blog. So I actually had gotten pretty involved in social media. Uh, and my experiences started shifting a little bit um, at, while running for office or running for national office. Again, I was 24 years old. My first four years on social media was just with my friends, um, or, you know, again, quote unquote friends, uh, in terms of the way Facebook describes them but it was just the people that I that I knew in college that were close to me and in 2008 uh, while I was uh, um, on the campaign trail if you will and actually uh, running for office at the national meeting um, I was talking with some students and a student approached me and said well hey I checked out all the candidates uh, information on Facebook and uh, you know I just came across something I was uh, you know just kind of wondering if how serious of a candidate you were. I was like, well, what are you, what are you talking about? And and she said, well, I, I, you know, checked you out on Facebook and it looked like you uh, were posing in front of uh, a pyramid of kegs, um, you know, and I just, it looked like, uh, you, you know, just didn't seem like you were that serious of a candidate. And I was like, my jaw just dropped. I was like, yeah, I, I was posing in front of, of a pyramid of empty kegs. Um, uh, and 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 had to explain that uh, at the University of Kentucky, uh, I was uh, one of the leaders at our school and actually had helped organize a huge uh, tailgating event where yes, there was alcohol involved. Again, I was 24 years old and, and didn't think the use of alcohol was that. I mean, I, I guess I didn't think it was that big of a deal. But the picture that I had posted on Facebook, uh, in which I was completely sober and actually kind of one of the people trying to organize the event um, it made it look like I was just this big partier uh, and it really kind of changed changed the image of what people thought of me uh, and and it started changing the way I you know I, I looked at Facebook and in 2009 uh, you know when I was in my final year of pharmacy school I actually was getting more heavily involved in research uh, with social media, thanks to uh, Jeff Kane, who is a uh, uh, and also Frank Romanelli, a couple professors at the University of Kentucky, as well as Joe Fink. Um, again, several professors that were that I considered mentors of mine and people that I really looked up to um, helped me kind of get involved in, in looking at social media from a research perspective. Uh, by 2011. I was actually attacked by a company uh, uh, that I, you know, won't, we'll, we'll leave off here in terms of the name of this company. But essentially, I, I had a blog for for several years, for three to about three years, and had gotten quite a big following on this blog. Well, on my blog, I criticized a particular company um, for some practices that I disagreed with, and they actually found out where I worked and and reached out to you know higher level people where I worked to try to get me fired, um, and just could not believe it. I mean, I wasn't unprofessional. I wasn't attacking them on an unprofessional grounds. I and I essentially was calling out some of their business practices well that that really shocked me um, and and actually uh, let my blog kind of expire I created an alias for my Twitter account and my blog and um, and kind of got away from putting my personal name on things uh, for a while because I was very cynical in the sense that I couldn't believe that a, a fortune 500 company would actually attack me um, 
personally, and 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 it just blew my mind. I, and one of my buddies joked, he's like, "Well, you know, at least at least uh, you know you got somebody's attention with your writing." And I was like, "Yeah, that's that's all well and good, but I got to pay off my student loans, so uh, I don't want to go any further down that road." Uh, 2012, um, LinkedIn was the main reason why I left the Kroger company. Uh, while I was on LinkedIn, a re- professional recruiter reached out to me uh, to let me, you know, they, they started recruiting me, if you will, uh, for a position for the startup company. And, you know, again, if it wasn't for social media, I never would have had that opportunity. And so we come full circle, I guess, or, you know, from when I was in school and on social media to now back in school at age 30, uh, now as an assistant professor with the School of Pharmacy, um, back to researching and getting involved in research for social media and using social media as we'll post this lecture on YouTube today. I, I'm very um, interested in, in the area and, and, and trying to get the best out of social media without, maybe without having to uh, you know, uh, deal with all the pitfalls that, that I've experienced. But, you know, going, I, I share this experience with you to let you know that I, you know, I, when I joined Facebook, I, um, you know, I was a 20 year old student and, um, and in, in a 10 year period, when I think about, and now I'm age 30, uh, thinking about how things have evolved with social media, but, and, and kind of sharing some of the things that I've been through, I've seen the ups and the downs, uh, uh, the good and the bad and the ugly. And, um, and so I am hoping that, that my experience, I can, you know, share it in a way and talk about why some of these things happen. And, and hopefully you guys can learn a few things and, um, and take what you will from it and, and benefit from it. So before we get started, I want to talk about Web 2.0. Essentially, it's uh, it's it's an open it, it's Web 2.0 uh, is is the evolution from from a traditional internet where sites were created, users could go to the website, have the information, where uh, as a you know where uh, essentially it was more passive information is the best way to explain it. Um, Web 2.0 applications and and the what has kind of led to social media um, it, it comes from the open access uh, users adding value again I'll say that again the user of the website is now also the creator if you will so we think about it um, instead of us waiting for MSNBC or CNN or whoever to put media out there for us uh, we can create our own media with our own webcam or iPhone or whatever you have um, it it also creates, you know, a rich user experience, and then the user itself kind of connects with the other users who are putting the media together. Um, and you know, and this is kind of what gives gives given the rise to this whole concept of social media and 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 as well as social networking. You know, we're really in an era uh, era of social media. We you know, ten years post Facebook, and I you know, I use use Facebook as kind of they're kind of the the Goliath. Uh, you know, the number two ranked uh, website. Uh, well, you know, actually, so in this in this list, I wanted to kind of list uh, social media websites by, by based on ranking in the United States. And actually, I left off the number one website as Google because I figured you know I. I when you're looking at it, you don't think of Google as a social media website. It is uh, more of a search engine platform. But one would argue that Google Google is very much social media these days with Google Plus and they own YouTube and everything else. But anyway, this list kind of shows uh, the top, um, you know, social media sites that are within the top 20. Uh, and so you can see that that essentially 12 of the top 20 websites visited in the United Sta- States are primarily based on social media. Um, one of the changes with with uh, this era that we're in is the evolution of the cell phone, um, going from a uh, from a Zach Morris phone. Well, again, you guys may not even get the Zach Morris reference. Uh, Basically, a uh, going from an old school uh, cell phone, uh, or a, 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 I guess prior to even having cell phones, um, the phones were essentially I'm going to call you and speak to you. Well, with uh, with cell phones becoming smartphones and we're streaming data through mobile networks, they're essentially um, you know many computers in your hand, and you're accessing these uh, applications um, anywhere you go. 
and so this kind of helped spearhead the you know popularity of micro blogging you know um, from someone who who was a blogger I guess still am a blogger um, micro blogging is super popular because it doesn't take it's not like blogging where you sit down and write an article Twitter you just send out in 140 characters hey this is what's going on or whatever um, so anyway I think the popularity of micro blogging has really connected connected everyone and so now this is where we shift over to the e-professionalism paradigm and uh, you know as we get started talking about it I'm gonna cite and go back to uh, Dr. Jeff Kane uh, from University of Kentucky uh, and Dr. Frank Romanelli and a couple uh, Dr. Joe Fink these uh, professors who have, have done a lot of really good work uh, Dr. Fox um, there's several several people that have been publishing in the era of social media in pharmacy uh, and I highly recommend you check some of these uh, some of their papers out. Um, one of the first papers in 2009 that really started using uh, the e-professionalism term and, and taking the professionalism construct. So when you think, you know, we're part of a profession and not, you know, which is defined as an occupation whose members share common characteristics. Um, and that a professional is a member of this profession who, who displays certain traits like uh, knowledge, uh, self-improvement, ethics, trustworthiness, uh, relationship with the client, um, you know, again, where these professionalism constructs come from. And I guess professionalism is the active demonstration of these pers professional traits, so actively demonstrating uh, ethics, trustworthiness, uh, service orientation, pride in the profession, accountability. The uh, the construct of e-professionalism takes a new twist. So professionalism is is yes an active demonstration of these pr professional traits, but um, do you always display professionalism? And 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 that's where we're going to really start talking about um, e-professionalism. Really de 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 describes these attitudes and behaviors that that reflect these traditional paradigms but are now manifested through social media and and what that's uh, you know how that's how that's impacting uh, our students and our, our active uh, pharmacists and and all of us alright so if I have a patient and and I ask a patient hey you know we might uh, use this case and again we're not going to mention your name but we might use this ca you know use your case to to help teach students at the court at the school of pharmacy what do you think the patient would think you know will my health information be used to educate for educational purposes for the course you teach at the school okay uh, that's fine I'm, I, I can be cool with that and what, now what if you ask the same question but then instead of teaching a, a particular course at the school of pharmacy you say well you know we would like to use your information um, and publish on a on a blog that we write. Um, does that change? Would that change the patient's level of concern uh, in terms of privacy or uh, any other any other information any other thought that they may have? What about a practitioner? From a practitioner standpoint, thinking, "Gosh, will I be fired or sued for sharing my opinions and experiences during a conference?" You know, say you go to the APHA meeting or uh, ASHP, and and you're giving a presentation, or maybe just networking and walking around and talking with with fellow colleagues. How often do we have people express their opinions, you know, verbally to one another at a meeting? Now, take those same opinions and experiences and put them on Facebook. Does it change anything? How about the employer's point of view? How will our pharmacist comment or comments uh, our pharmacist comments at an annual meeting impact our company's brand? So, you know, how much stock do you think a Walgreens or CVS takes on thinking? Well, you know, so we have our pharmacists that are traveling to this annual meeting. Um, you know, they're just going to develop and whatever, and they're com communicating with fellow colleagues. Uh, are we really worried about what that's going to do to our company brand? Well. You know, for the answer is probably they're probably not too concerned because it's going to be on a small scale. But what, what about if uh, our our same pharmacists make comments on Twitter? Could that impact our company's brand? Does that make a difference? And so the 
So the real question is, you know, what makes Facebook or Twitter or any other social media construct, what makes it so different than other public settings? So the public settings that have been around for ages, you know, the water cooler talk or the uh, going out going out to the bar with, with some friends and chatting about, you know, chatting about your day. What makes Facebook so different? And this is where e-professionalism really comes in. And 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 listening to, um, you know, it was really really a great experience for me to work with. Uh, like I said, the professors I talked about before that that had a really good grasp of how Facebook was shifting the 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 way we um, viewed professionalism. And when you think about it, a site like Facebook, they're considered a mediated public site so you know what does that mean and and from this um, uh, article uh, on the knowledge tree from 2007 um, you know they really explain it quite well and that information on on Facebook or on social media uh, is searchable you know it's replicable uh, we can make ton you can print it out make tons of copies of it um, it's recorded indefinitely you don't I mean you think you own that information you don't own that information the information is now out there and it's owned by typically the you, know, you should look at the social media websites that you're on um, you know who owns the information and and the information essentially is available to your intended audiences, which may be your friends, uh, but it's also available to unintended audiences. So maybe you know your friend is a friend of someone else, and you were taught whatever you were talking about. You weren't anticipating that other person looking at your information, and and so depending on how your privacy settings are set, and depending on how your your accounts are set up, you you're your micro blogs or your whatever information you're putting out there could end up falling into the wrong hands I should you should say um, and then what about context you know uh, context is so huge I mean ba behavior that 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 you may display in front of your classmates because you know they're your buddies you hang out with them on a regular basis you know the the jokes that you might say to each other that 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 they're good with they laugh at that you get a good response how does that same behavior play out in front of coworkers? Or maybe maybe how does that those same jokes play out in front of your your parents or your professors or maybe your employers? So what is the context that you're using the information in? And, and you know a, a social media post may lack the the appropriate context that that behavior is displayed in. So what are some e-professionalism challenges? Um, you know one there's a major blur between public and private communication um, you know identifying you know people that think well this is this is my public profile and this is my private profile well uh, how how public and how private are they how how well are they separated are they do they kind of mingle together when are when are you a pharmacist and when you're not a, when are you not a pharmacist and is there ever a divide can you ever truly divide public and private um, I think the definition of privacy is is a fascinating one. I think uh, thinking of of what some people would regard as information that they intended to be private versus uh, what other you know what what truly is private and gets out. And and you know what's fascinating is that you also uh, uh, see see generational differences with the uh, definition of privacy. So knowing uh, knowing that like maybe you and other people your age would think oh yeah that that's that's that should be private that that should be off limits maybe someone from the baby boomer generation or generation x and an older generation may think differently um really knowing your audience is important um you know and and what i get a kick out of in social media i think of uh the use of the word friends um is interesting you know in facebook when you connect you're you know you're now a friend and 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 we know from our experience that not all friends are created equally i mean you know you have maybe your best friend that would be your you know that might be your uh best man in your wedding or your maid of honor you know that that's like a brother or sister to you um 
and then you have you know tertiary friends or friends that are maybe a little further removed from you that you're acquaint more of acquaintances well in Facebook it doesn't really differentiate uh, and, and it's starting to, you know they're starting to have more category categories now that you can maybe group friends but again you're still kind of you know it's like friend not friend um, but it, but essentially knowing your audience are they you know what is it is it a group of acquaintances or are they people that um, you know that you can uh, communicate with as as it would have been like a traditional friend construct um, perception of a behavior so um, you know how something's perceived and you know I hear a lot of times uh, perceptions reality and and that's something I think all of us have to be cognizant of um, back to the context piece distortion you know uh, you know what you said get can get distorted and taken out of context um, and finally anonymous users you know I, I um, I'm blown away sometimes with uh, with what people are willing to say and and post when they are kept anonymous you know uh, however you know when I was attacked uh, personally by a large company um, I then realized the the value of being anonymous. I mean, if if you're going to say something publicly, there could be consequences. And so, while I I really personally believe that we should be transparent with our communication and stand by what we say, you know, if it affects your livelihood and and you know if if your uh, you know, your, if it could cost you your job or whatever that is, you really need to think about, is it worth it? Is it worth making a post on Facebook or Twitter or whatever social media account you're using? Is that is that uh, post worth what you may end up having to pay? And so, anyway, thinking about that um, has really, you know, over the years, I've kind of gone back and forth on how I feel about anonymous users. I just think that... Um, uh, it's a challenge that we have. Uh, you don't know who's posting what. All right, so let's uh, let's end the end this section with a question. And and you guys know if I'm giving you a question that you might want to remember this question. It might show up later on a quiz or an exam. Um, so what differentiates a Web 2.0 or a social media application from a traditional internet web page? Is it anonymity? Uh, anonymity oh, sorry I butchered that one accessibility password protection the user can add value or e none of the above I'll give you a second to think about it alright the answer for this is that the user can add value that's the main differentiator between social media uh, and and more traditional web pages all right, we'll uh, jump over to part two. So I'll give you a little bit of a break and uh, come back for the next segment, if I can find.